This is Caribbean News Desk. I'm Dennis Chabrol. In this edition, the sub regional organization of Eastern Caribbean states told to help bail out Antigua and Barbuda from its biggest deficit ever. A teacher's strike looms in Barbuda's. Combating violent crime across the Caribbean faces ups and downs. A Cuban human rights organization says almost 9,000 persons arbitrarily arrested last year, more than the previous year. An American-owned airline hopes to force financially troubled Caribbean airlines to reduce its fares on the Guyana-New York route. And a former Trinidad and Tobago minister drowns. The details coming up. We are one Caribbean, one people, one nation. We the same destiny, separated we are as one. Let's come together, one market economy. Caribbean is how it should be. Trinidadian economist Patrick Watson wants governments of the sub-regional organization of Eastern Caribbean states to intervene in helping Antigua and Barbuda to cope with its highest ever fiscal deficit. Last week, Prime Minister Gaston Brown announced that a $207 million U.S. million deficit for 2015 will be the highest in the country's history. But Watson says that discrepancy can place pressure on other members of the monetary union being governed by the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. Watson says he's surprised that the other OECS leaders have remained silent on the issue. To the extent that this is more based on recurrent, ex- there is a pressure that is going to be put on the foreign exchange reserves of Antigua and Barbuda, and to the extent that that is linked to the rest of the OECS, on the, on the rest of the OECS as well. My own feeling eh, is that I don't understand how the, the, the other OECS countries have not intervened in this, in this matter to see whether they think that this is a wise movement or not. Given that you operate under one central bank and that the, the pressure is going to be put all around and just on, on Antigua and, and, and Barbuda, I don't understand how they have not inter, intervened to impose some kind of fiscal discipline. Days ahead of the January 12 budget, Prime Minister Brown said that the deficit was not created by the policies of a six-month-old government. For 2015, we will have easily the single largest funding deficit in the history of the country, $450 million. That's about 70% of all revenues. Now, it's important for the people of the country to understand that we did not create that situation. It's an inheritance. Brown, who is also finance minister, is expected to detail on Monday what contributed to the 2015 deficit. Trinidad and Tobago's government said Monday it was raising law enforcement agencies' state of alert after a spike in gang-related homicides claimed 10 lives in the first few days of 2015. The National Security Ministry says there will be more policy visibility and defense patrols, as well as roadblocks and stops for searches to bring the situation under immediate control. At the same time, the ministry assures that a current alert state of readiness is in no way intended to curtail civil liberties, but has become necessary to ensure the safety and security for all. Sean Carabajo, 18, became the 10th victim since the beginning of 2015. Police told the Guardian newspaper that Carabajo had fallen under the radar in relation to gang-related activity over the past two years. National Diversity and Social Integration Minister Roger Samuel called in early 2014 for the resumption of hangings to combat the high level of violence after 16 murders were registered during that year's first week, the Trinidad and Tobago Express reported at the time. Jamaicans are hoping that a lull in serious and violent crimes recorded in 2014 will continue during the new year. Jamaica has recorded a 16% decrease in serious and violent crimes for 2014. In a letter to Jamaica's Police Commissioner Dr. Carl Williams, the National Security Minister Peter Bunting commended the Jamaican Constabulary Force for their work in lowering what was a spiraling crime rate.
Keisha Ann Slate reports from Kingston, Jamaica. According to the preliminary statistics from Jamaica's Ministry of National Security, murders were down 16%, shootings by 12%, rape by 23%, aggravated assault by 17%, and acquisitory crimes by 10.5%. Police fatal shootings also declined by 54%, and there was a 19% reduction in arrests. In his letter to the commissioner, released to the local media national security minister Peter Bunting commended the police for their commitment to crime fighting. He added that the Jamaica Constabulary Force could count on the support of his ministry during 2015. And in a later press release, Mr. Bunting also commended the role the Jamaica Defense Force played in aiding in the reduction in serious crimes. He said through joint operations and critical operational capabilities, that includes helicopter support, military intelligence, as well as command and control systems and information management, the Army aided in the noted reduction. Keisha N. Slate in Kingston, Jamaica for Caribbean News Desk. Across the Twin Island Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, authorities there say that a crime situation has not worsened like back in 2011. Police Commissioner Salvin Jaron C.G. Walwyn says that while the level of crime in 2014 was the same as in 2013, it is certainly better than three years ago. Walwyn, who is a former senior law enforcement officer in Texas, United States, told WinFM Radio that among the successes made under his tenure is the reduction of gang-related homicides. The positive is we have not returned to the numbers that we had in 2011 when I first came here. We have seen uh, the numbers drop and we have seen them increase this year, but they are not increased above what they were. So it means that whatever we are doing is working. It's just going to take time for it to take hold. It takes about three to five years to get changes to take hold. And we can see now over the last three years, if you look at the statistics, crime is still down in the Federation. One bright thing that came out of this year, even though we had homicides, the number of gang-related persons dying decreased to less than 10 this year. So that's a good thing. Among the crime-fighting tools, he says, are Facebook, WhatsApp, and Crime Stoppers, which is manned in Canada. The Cuban Commission for Human Rights and National Reconciliation on Monday said that Cuban authorities made 8,899 arbitrary arrests for political reasons during 2014, some 2,500 more than during the previous year. According to a report released by the dissident group on Monday, in December there were 489 arrests, about 100 more than in November. In December, just on Human Rights Day, there were more than 230 arrests, some of them with violence, as well as 70 arrests on December 30 at a performance convened by artist Tanya Brogrera. Brogrera intended on that day to set up in the emblematic Plaza of the Revolution a public platform so that Cubans could express their desires for the country's future after the announcement of the re-establishment of diplomatic relations with the United States on December 17. According to figures compiled by the dissident group, Cuban authorities arrested a total of 59 people on that day as they attended or tried to attend the event to exercise their right to freedom of expression. Of the people arrested, some were held by the authorities for up to 72 hours, including Bruguera, independent journalist Reinaldo Escobar, Antonio Gonzalez Rodriguez, the organizer of a critical discussion project called Estados de Sats, and so-called Group of 75 member Angel Moya. In addition, that same day, Cuban authorities held 11 other opposition figures at their homes and prevented them from leaving, including blogger and independent online newspaper editor Ioanni Sanchez. The commission, headed by Lizardo Sanchez, also mentioned the positive act of announcing the re-establishment of relations between Havana and Washington, but it emphasized that the situation of civil and political rights on the island continues to be the worst in the Western Hemisphere. Classes in Barbados secondary schools are set for disruption on Tuesday as teachers are scheduled to pull out of classrooms in the morning 
and attend a meeting of their union to decide on a possible strike. The organization that speaks for most of the island's secondary teachers, the Barbados Union of Teachers, has been demanding the removal of the principals of the Alma Paris and Parkinson secondary schools because its members are unable to work with these heads. Teachers regard the administration's styles of those principals as too firm. Additionally, the union is dissatisfied with what it sees as a slow movement towards appointment of some teachers. Union representatives left a meeting with Ministry of Education officials last Friday dissatisfied with government's response to their demands and called the meeting of members for Tuesday, the second day of the new school term. A Caribbean News Desk correspondent in Barbados says that the Education Ministry has only said that has commenced action in the case of the Parkinson Secondary School and action is pending for Alma Paris. No deadlines have been given and there has been reported and that there has been no reported word on the status of the teachers' appointments. Union President Pedro Shepard confirmed with local television station Barbados today that a meeting is set for tomorrow. We are currently going ahead with a planned meeting, special general meeting for our membership on Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. at Baradani House. And we are asking all teachers, all members of the of teachers, to attend this very important meeting to be updated on the status at Alma Paris School, at Parkinson School, as, as well as the status of the appointments of temporary teachers, which is being handled by the Public Administration Department. Meanwhile, parents voiced their concerns to a local radio station on the impact of the teacher's withdrawal of service. It's ridiculous. I will say it's ridiculous because the ministry updated. They, they have been meeting with the ministry on Friday. That leaves Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Why wait until Tuesday? And then say as an excuse that on Monday, they don't want to pull out the teachers because Monday is the planning day. But if Monday is the planning day, let them put in the extra effort in the afternoon and meet after the planning day. Why wait until the children have to come back into school and do it? Because I mean, when they're in the school, what are they going to be doing? What I would like to know is why, after the children have been home on holidays for three weeks, they wait until the day that they're about to go back into school and now call this meeting. I'm sure they had ample time during the holidays to figure out whatever problems that they have in order to call this meeting before this critical time. The Florida Keys in the extreme southeast of the United States will practice mosquito control with the aid of drones. This method has for the first time been approved for the task by the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA. Starting in February, two unmanned aircraft equipped with cameras will be used to spot the kind of stagnant waters where mosquitoes breed. According to the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District, this area of Monroe County has approximately 45 species of mosquitoes, some of which are carriers of such diseases as dengue, malaria, and encephalitis. Michael Doyle, the executive director of the local agency, said that this is the first district in the United States to obtain a permit from the FAA to use drones for that purpose. He says that they intend to be extremely careful in their use and will keep them far from the airports at Key West and Miami. An American charter airline that is flying the New York Guyana route hopes that competition with Caribbean Airlines will help reduce fares. For several years now, the Guyana government has criticized the Trinidad and Tobago owned carrier for alleged price gouging whenever that airline has a monopoly on international flights to and from Guyana. Since Delta Airlines pulled out its charter service about two years ago from Guyana, a number of newly established airlines and its services have emerged only to collapse a few months after. In a market where suspicion is high about new carriers offering services on North America to Guyana routes because of decades-long experiences of flight delays, cancellations, and eventual closure, the Greensboro, North Connecticut-based Dynamic Airways has suffered from the same stigma. Though regarded as a well-established company, Dynamic Airways began operations last year July without getting all the necessary federal and New York state approvals that caused cancellations and eventually a suspension of flights to Guyana that lasted until November. When it did resume flights to and from Guyana, 
there were at least 10 delays of an hour or more due to technical problems, safety judgments by pilots, and administrative bottlenecks. Two flights were also cancelled around Christmas Eve, inconveniencing hundreds of passengers, some of whom had to decide on flying Caribbean Airlines. Chief Executive Officer of Roraima Airways, Jerry Gavaya, whose company enjoys a business relationship with, Dy- with Dynamic Airways, says that the American-owned airline should be credited for lowering fares on the New York Guyana route. I'm a big supporter of Caribbean Airlines, but when we don't have competition, you see what happens to the fares. When you have a, when you have a stable airline, when, so long as they're in the market, place the other airlines, they can't send the fares to the roof. So you, when you have this kind of, and this is not, you, they can't put dynamic out of business. Caribbean Airlines can't put that, they can't go into price war with dynamic areas. These, these people, they got, they're too big. Um, this is not in terms of Caribbean Airlines, how they, you Watch. So long as dynamics stay in this route and they will stay, carbon fares will come back down. Their fares will come back down. They, 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 they can't they can benchmark these fares at high, at high levels. They're going to they're they're lose passengers. Trinidad and Tobago's former Minister of National Security, Martin Joseph, drowned Monday while bathing on a beach on the island of Tobago. At the time, he was holidaying with a friend and in Norton business for the main opposition People's National Movement. Joseph was in his 60s. He served as parliamentary representative for the St. Anne's East constituency from 1995 to 2002. One year later, November 2003, he was appointed Minister of National Security. And that's it for Caribbean News Desk. Thank you for joining us, and we'll also take this opportunity to wish you a happy 2015. I'm Dennis Chabrol.